Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about code evolution and affecting things. So let's get into it. So the question in question was basically, Frederick, my code base is growing into something really, really ugly. What can I do? And the short answer is you have to commit to making the right decisions, my friend. So let's like let me just let me explain here because this is a fluffy one or it's a very tricky one I think to to express in a good way. So everything that I have to say about this topic I think can be summarized in saying that we all have to start somewhere. And what I mean by that is basically that when you start a company or you start a code base or you start something whatever you do you are in what we call an experimental phase. And basically what that means is that you don't really know what's going to work and what's not going to work. And this is one of the most important realizations that you can possibly have. So I really want you to listen to this. You don't know what's going to work. Now, if you accept that, you are already ahead of I don't know how many people because there are so many people out there who are worried that in the early stages of early stages of their company they're going to make a mistake. They're going to pick the wrong language, the wrong stack or something like that and their entire company is going to fall to shit because of it. And that is just not true. Because in the early days, the most important thing that you can optimize for is development speed, iteration speed, things, the time to market, how quickly can you ship something, how quickly can you change your, your application to fit into a new business requirement. These things are much more important. And the reason is very simple, because in the earlier days, you don't, as I said, you don't know what's going to work. And you might get an investor comes in and says, hey, you know what, we think that there's potential here, but we need you to change a few things. And here, this is where you, if you, if this is where you're going to show if you're an entrepreneur or if you're a die-hard engineer. You see, a die-hard engineer is going to say, "No, I don't want that for my product because you are asking me to do a bunch of ugly custom integration to an old API with XML and shit like that, and I wrote everything in JSON and it's absolutely flawless. It's using GraphQL and things like that." And I don't want to, I, I don't, this is, this, uh, this is going to get ugly. My code is going to get ugly. And then the investors are going to go, oh, okay, sorry. We expected you to think about, we, we thought we, you were going to think about this in a different way. And then they're going to fuck off with all their money or your customers or so far. Like they're going to go somewhere else. And then you're going to sit there with your absolute flawless, perfect code. And your company is never going to go anywhere. An entrepreneur is going to go, oh, okay, sure. We can do that. Of course. Now, the difference, at least in my opinion, about a, like a sustainable solution here and getting into deep waters with legacy is how long are you going to have that attitude? And what does that mean? Well, you see, in the early days, you have to pretty much say yes to almost everything. I'm not saying everything, everything, but a lot, because you are not in a power position. You are not in a position of negotiation, really because you're desperate. You, whenever you're starting a product, you're desperate to see if you can figure out how can I get people to actually see the value of this product. And usually people will have suggestions. They will have their own desires. They want things to work in a different way because they have, they're humans and they want their own thing. And investors especially, or if you're dealing with customers and things like that. And you see the, the beautiful part about it is that if you don't comply, all they have to go and do is say, oh no, not interested. Uh, or maybe, yeah, this, this seemed very promising, but if you're not going to do that, then we're going to find something else because they're not invested. So at some point, you're going to reach a situation where you will have a strong enough value proposition. Now, the value proposition is very simple. It just means that your product has now grown to be so useful that people are okay. Like they really want to use this thing and they are open to not having everything. They, are, they still want stuff, but they're open to compromising. It's like, 
I don't know. It's like a, it's like reading a book almost. If your book starts sucking at the first page, you're going to lose the reader. But if you can hook them so they're halfway in, then you can afford to have a chapter or two that isn't super great and still have them committed to the book because they've already invested enough to keep on going. It's a very similar thing. Nobody in their right mind would use an, a digital product that is really, really bad and then continue to use it even though like it never gets improved in any way. So you have to improve it at almost every, any cost until a certain point, until people see the value of it. Now, when you reach that stage, when you see that now you actually have enough of an investment from different people or the product has developed to a point where it's actually getting some traction, this is when the really tri tricky part comes. Because usually you have a few salespeople or you have different stakeholders who have different requirements. So now you can go down one of two paths. You can continue to be the entrepreneur here and just say yes to everything. Or I don't really like to say that you're an entrepreneur, but let's say that you're a sales representative or you're a sales guy of some sort. You can continue to comply with every single thing that your customer wants. And the problem with that is that, or which is a lot, which not that many salespeople understand, is that you get the deal every single time, but at some point you're going to have a system that is so shit that nobody wants to use it. And just FYI, guys, some of the most successful startups have been built on simplifying products that have made this exact mistake. There is an entire, there are billions of dollars to be made from creating a simpler solution to companies who just said yes to absolutely everything and their system. There are so many consumers out there who are just waiting for a simpler way of doing their taxes, simpler way of booking a flight, simpler way of finding a flight. There are so many areas where companies have stayed in this phase of just complying with every single request that they get to the point where the product is actually really bad. And as I've said in a few videos before, what happens then is that, oh, your someone is going to come in, provide a simpler solution, and the whole cycle starts over again. Well, sometimes you can, of course, I mean, you can still run a successful company with a system that does too much, but there are there is an opening because the system has grown too complicated. And that is the that is the paradox. You want all the features, but you want them in a simple way. Or rather, you want to make the most amount of money and you have different stakeholders and they all want their own thing. And now you need to deal with, okay, what am I going to say yes to and what am I not going to say yes to? And that is the core message I'm trying to get here. At some point, you will reach, a, we reach this level of maturity and now you're going to have to start making the hard calls. You're going to have to start thinking about how can I sustain a, a a stable roadmap like if you go and watch the product go watch videos on product management and things of this nature this is exactly what they will tell you as a product owner it is your job to do what's best for the product and to make sure that it fulfills all the requirements and all the needs of your different customers but the problem is that you can't just say yes to every idea that your customer has you have to find a holistic way of solving these sorts of problems because otherwise the product is going to get really shitty it's like I've said many times before, if you want to build a toaster, well, technically you could build a toaster with Bluetooth support, it can make waffles, it can make, well, technically they can if you're frozen waffles, but I don't know. They are, the, the, the toaster is also a, a, a utility tool, it's also a toothbrush, a soap dispenser, like you can put every single feature on the plant on the toaster, but it's going to fuck up the toaster. That's what's going to happen. And that's the thing that you need to start thinking about when you get, if you want to avoid your code to get really, really ugly. At some point, you need to start thinking, stop thinking about one-off solutions for every single company and start thinking about how can we, like these are the problems of our, uh, our customers. How can we find a way to produce a feature within our system that works for all of them? So that they all feel like, yeah, and trust me when I say this, it's not a configuration system. Shit, no, it's not. A, sometimes it's a configuration system, but damn, it's easy to add a configuration. But that's also, that's a whole different video. It's about dilute, like, 
distilling down and really getting into the essence of what is the problem that they are trying to solve and how can we produce a flexible feature that feels intuitive to them. An example I like to take is, do you see, like, if you have a problem with, I don't know, Google Analytics or one of their products, do you call into Google and say, hey, you know what, this isn't working for me and unless you fix it, I'm not going to use your product. Do you think that they're going to rewrite how certain their features are working just because you feel that way? Well, if you're a multi-billion dollar company, maybe, but what Google and other IT companies are trying to do is this exact thing. They're trying to figure out how they can produce a feature that works for more companies or more customers than just one or two. So what I want you to take away from this is pretty much that if you want to avoid your system, f to like if you want to avoid getting your system into a really bad place and having it become a really, really ugly legacy system, you will have to accept that first and foremost, you will have legacy because in the early, 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 early days of the creation of your system, you don't know what's going to work. So odds are that you're just trying things out to just get everybody on board so you can get to both the learnings but also money in so that you can continue the work. So usually the oldest part of the system is among the ugliest parts of the system because of this very reason. But at some point, the system will have evolved to a point where it fulfills most of these normal requirements and you're going to start seeing a red thread through the needs of your customers. And now you can make that decision. You can continue as you have and just add every feature just to sign every single contract. Or you can start a bit of a negotiation process and a learning experience with your customers. And you can try to figure out from more than one customer, you don't just add one feature per customer, one off solutions as we call it. You start thinking in a, in a broader fashion and you think, these customers, what do they have in common? And how can I take those problems and those requirements and distill them down into something where I can build one generic feature that actually works for all of them. This is the decision that you have in front of you if you want to be able to scale your system to work for more and more people. Have a great day.